have you have you gained those to compete? You listen to my radio. I listen every day. Oh, I got into one today. I'm like, really? Research my news. Okay, so life in the ocean. So we're done with uh, the physical components, pretty much of the course. Physical oceanography. Now we're going to transition to uh, life in the ocean. So this le this lesson and this lecture is kind of like an overview, all right, uh, about the uh, things that influence life in the ocean and the different processes that influence life in the ocean. Okay, both uh, some physical factors and biological factors as well. Uh, so we start. It's uh, you know a big question, and we kind of talked about this in the very first. Uh, lecture in your introduction that it's thought that life on Earth got its start in the ocean because um, the ocean was the most hospitable environment way back when. And uh, how that life came to be on Earth is still a mystery. We don't know. Uh, we don't know if life originated here on Earth. Life came from a different planet, or so forth. But uh, one famous experiment is the Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s, where they tried to see if they could synthesize life from inorganic matter. So a process called biosynthesis. Uh, they were able to create amino acids. So using inorganic materials that would have been around in the ocean, then using energy electricity, they're able to uh, form amino acids, which amino acids are the basic building blocks of life. Okay, so these amino acids, they combine to make more complex organic molecules, but, uh, but it's not life, right? Amino acids are just the building blocks of life, but not life. So uh, that, that, that was an interesting uh, result that they were able to create those amino acids, but that's like so amino acids. You're speaking um, about like um, vitamins. Well, uh, I mean, vitamins. There's a large vitamins are a wide variety of different things, but uh, amino acids are basically the uh, these very basic molecules that combine to form more complex molecules, such as like DNA. Okay, oh. so um, uh, these amino acids are pretty much the most basic organic molecule from life. Uh, so it's like being able to make the bricks, but knowing how to put the bricks together to make a building, right, that functions. It's, it's a large leap from being able to make the bricks to actually building the building, right? So so that's a good analogy to what here. But it was a step in the direction of coming to some understanding of how life may have got its start. Uh, but we do know from the fossil record what the earliest form of life on Earth looked like. And so the first form of life, at least according to the fossil record, was prokaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells are those cells that lack a nucleus, that do not have a nucleus. Okay? And so uh, you see in this figure here on the top, let's label bacteria, that's a prokaryotic cell. Uh, so prokaryotic cells are usually in unicellular organisms. So the entire organism consists of one cell. And so bacteria is a good example of, of, of a um, prokaryotic uh, organism. And so uh, these, these uh, <clears throat> bacteria, they have these little flagella that help them, and uh, these little flagella and this large flagellum that helps them move, okay? And uh, this is a cyanobacteria, which is a photosynthetic bacteria. And so it's important that we realize that why were the first forms of life on Earth, at least the first dominant form of life on Earth, these uh, back prokaryotic cells, these bacteria, why were they photosynthetic? Well, 
What is photosynthesis? Does anyone know what photosynthesis is? It's this is like the mixture of different um, um, photo picture. Okay. Has to do with light. Has to do with light. So the photo. Yeah, light, water, and all those different. So it, recall, it, it involves light and water. It's the process. By which plants and algae produce carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So photosynthesis is the process in which energy in the form of light is used to take inorganic material, inorganic substances and make organic molecules known as carbohydrates or hy hydrocarbons. Photosynthesis is the process that plants and algae perform to make sugars that they make their bodies out of. Okay, So photosynthesis is creating organic matter from inorganic matter using energy uh, in the form of light from the sun. So this is what plants do. Okay, It's also what the earliest form of life on Earth did, these bacteria. They are photosynthetic. Why? They had to make their own food. They're the first form of life. There is no organisms for them to eat. They're, they're the new kids on the block, right? There's nothing for them to eat. They have to make their own food. Okay? So these first, this first form of life on Earth were these prokaryotic cells, these bacteria, they're called cyanobacteria. That means photosynthetic bacteria. And uh, the name of these particular cyanobacteria, these early ones, were called stromatolites. And we'll see why in a second. Here's some uh, images of different uh, bacterium, these photosynthetic bacterium that the earliest forms of life may have looked like. Okay, these are all, of course, um, microscopic images. But here are some pictures of stromatolites. This is in Shark Bay in Australia. You see these nodules that look like they're made out of stone. Well, these cyanobacteria, these early form of life, they like to stick together. So they secrete this sticky um, secretion uh, and it forms this some of a sticky mat that all of the bacteria can stick to. And so they don't just float around in the ocean. But the problem is, is sediment floating around the ocean also sticks to that sticky mat. And so just like a piece of scotch tape, right, if you stick it and peel it off enough surfaces, it accumulates enough dirt or dust that the tape is no longer sticky. Well, that would happen to the sticky mat. And so then the, once enough sediment accumulated on that sticky mat, the bacteria had to migrate to the outside of that layer of sediment that accumulated and form a new sticky mat. And that process repeated over time, and it formed these nodules known as stromatolites. And you can see here's a cross-section of one. You can see these layers running through here. Oh, actually, let's use a laser pointer. You can see these, these layers moving through uh, across here. And those, each layer is formed by those bacteria. So you're looking at what the earliest form of life at least the earliest known form of life on Earth looked like. Okay, that you might say that primordial ooze, you know, this, the ocean quivering with bacteria. Here's another cross section of one of those stromatolites. You can see the layering. This is actually a fossil imprint of on the bacteria from these stromatolites. So this is the hard evidence that we have the, of this life on Earth. And the, the, the fossils date back to three and a half billion years ago. So that's the oldest direct evidence of life on Earth, three and a half billion years ago. Uh, there are some indirect pieces of evidence. Like, are these found in the ocean? Uh, they're found in these sedimentary rocks, like right here, uh, that were once an ocean but are no longer today. Okay. Um, there's also some evidence like light carbon isotopes. So um, organisms concentrate light carbon isotope. An isotope is an atom that has a different number of protons, uh, neutrons and protons. It's not really necessary to know for the scope of this course, but 
but uh, like uh, carbon 12 uh, will actually be like carbon carbon 13 and other light carbon isotopes they tend to concentrate in living organisms and those concentrations of light carbon isotopes they date back to 3.7 billion years ago and those are indirect evidence that life may have existed then but the most the the oldest direct evidence the actual fossil of an organism one of these prokaryotic cells dates back to three and a half billion years ago when you're talking about uh, life you're not talking about human life no no okay it's something that's alive right, right. something that's alive that uh that it, re it basically it reproduces uh, it has to make its own food or acquire food uh, yeah so just you know in the most basic form of life is one single one single cell that's alive and it's making its own food through photosynthesis yeah, not human life nope this is three and a half billion years ago this is a long time ago animals animals are a distant thought at this point but going along that path, life didn't stay that way, right? Obviously, life changed on Earth because we have different forms of life besides, besides bacteria, right? We have animals, we have plants, we have fungi. We have all these different types of life. So the next form of life to appear in the fossil record in Earth, on Earth were eukaryotic cells. These are cells with a nucleus. Okay. So this is the next form of life. And so the first evidence of life on Earth dates back to 3.5 billion years ago. Prokaryotic cells, those without a nucleus. The oldest evidence of eukaryotic cells, cells with a nucleus, dates back to 2.1 billion years ago. Okay. But so here's a cell with a nucleus. So this is a eukaryotic cell. And what the, you can see that there's a lot more going on in this cell than the prokaryotic cell. This cell has these smaller structures within it. They're known as organelles, and they perform uh, structures. Like, say, for example, the mitochondria. Mitochondria can take um, organic molecules, basically what we would call food, and convert them into something called ATP, which is energy that the cell can use. So these mitochondria are important for not having to make your own food, but being able to consume already preformed organic molecules, in other words, food, and use that for energy instead of making your own food. So, and the thing is, to have all these complex structures, these organelles that are performing complex ta tasks, you need a central command station. You know, just like your brain acts as the central command station for your body, telling your heart when to beat, telling your eyes when to blink, and so forth. That's the cell. And inside the cell uh, contains all the information, the DNA, that uh, tells all the organelles what to do. Okay. And so protists, which include algae, like seaweed, fungi, like mushrooms, Plants and animals, all are eukaryotes, meaning they have eukaryotic cells. Okay? So as I mentioned, uh, these uh, eukaryotic cells, here's in, some images of eukaryotic cells, they came on the scene about 2.1 billion years ago. Here's an example of a, a fossil. found. In, uh, the oldest ones are found in Michigan. These coiled up imprints of uh, probable algae. So the oldest form of, of eukaryotic organism was algae, okay, so that green slime, right, that forms in, in water, algae. Okay, so 2.1 billion years ago, eukaryotic cells appear on the planet. Well, how did we get from prokaryotic cells, cells without a nucleus, to eukaryotic cells, cells with a nucleus? Cells with these complex structures, known as organelles, inside of them, that can perform these complex functions. That's a big leap. And so life changed. The, the prokaryotic cells didn't disappear. They're still here today, right? They're still here today. 
There are still bacteria and everything living all around us. So how did that change occur? What process or what mechanism allowed for that change in life? Well, for most of you have heard of evolution before, right? And evolution, uh, driven by natural selection, uh, is the mechanism that describes how life on Earth changed. So basically, organisms live in an, in an environment, right? Whether it be the ocean, the land, um, you know, some environment. Well, that environment, it favors particular individuals within a population of organisms that are well adapted to that environment. And so, okay, and so the favorable traits that organisms have that allow them to be well adapted to the environment, they are retained over time throughout generations because they give that organism a competitive advantage. Okay, so favorable traits are retained throughout time from one generation uh, to the next because these favorable traits contribute to the organism's reproductive success. So the more well suited an organism is to its environment, the more successful it is. Either A, it's able to uh, access food more readily than other organisms, it's able to avoid being prey better than other organisms, so it lives a longer life, and as Spock would say, it lives long and was it multiply? Prosper. Prosper, yeah, the one with prosper, right? And so it has a higher rate of reproduction. Okay? And so where do these traits that an organism has that can be uh, well suited for the environment come from? They come from random mutations. Okay, so during reproduction, uh, in genetic information isn't copied perfectly. There are slight alterations in the reproduction of genetic material. So, um, for example, in, in, in sexual reproduction, you have meiosis inside the body, which is the process that produces sex cells, like sperm and ovum. Okay? And in that process of meiosis, uh, there's slight mutations that occur in the genetic material that are contained in those sex cells, the 13 chromosomes in each sex cell. And so those mutations that, are, that occur during the production of their sex cells, um, they're present, and then whenever those sex cells combine during reproduction to form an embryo, the way that those 13 chromosomes link up together to form the 26 chromosomes, say this is of humans, right? Other organisms have different number of chromosomes. Right? Humans have 26 chromosomes, and you get 13 from one parent, 13 from the other. And the way those chromosomes combine, the, the pairing of those genes brings about different mutations too. And so these mutations are random. Okay? So mutations can be hair color, height, right? They can be they can be anything, any sort of physical attribute. So, for example, if my whole family is five foot tall, my parents are about this tall. Like my, my mother, she has some 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 taller cousins, and so the the, the genes for for like six foot height, I'm about six foot one, they're floating around somewhere in the gene pool where I probably got them from. But let's say that no one in my ancestry ever lived above five foot tall. So that gene to be five foot uh, taller than five foot isn't in my gene pool. It's not passed down. And so for me to be taller than five foot, it would have to be a mutation, okay? Uh, an alteration to the genetic material during reproduction, okay? So a mutation. So uh, are you familiar with like albino organisms? That's a genetic mutation, right? Uh, some uh, genetic mutations are lethal. Right, and the organism doesn't even develop. Um, uh, and, but some, most genetic mutations are benign, and they just result in some different type of physical feature or attribute or trait. So these mutations are random with respect to fitness in the environment. And so whenever 
the reproduction or organisms reproduce and and the offspring comes forth, the offspring has these random mutations that the environment selects upon. Okay? And that's the natural selection. The environment selects upon these random mutations. And those mutations that bring about traits that are favorable for the environment, they give the organism a competitive advantage. Those traits are called adaptations. And they are selected upon. So let's say you uh, you're go back uh, you know, millions of years ago and, and uh, giraffes. Say giraffes don't have that long neck, so they're out in the savanna, and they're you know maybe picture a giraffe similar to a horse, and they're all competing for the same food source, right? They're all competing for the leaves on these trees. Then one giraffe, it's not a giraffe yet, it's born, and it has a mutation where it has this like abnormally long neck. Its neck is just a few inches longer. So just picture maybe a horse with just a kind of a oddly little bit longer neck. Well, that longer neck gives it an advantage, right? It can, it's higher, it can see predators better. It can reach leaves that all the other giraffes can't reach. And so it lives much longer life. It lives, it's more likely to live a longer life than, say, other giraffes. And so it has lots of babies. And it passes on that gene to its babies. Now, all its babies have that slightly longer neck. And they do really well, and they pass on that gene. And next thing you know, that gene proliferates through the entire population, and, and maybe like several generations down the road, all giraffes have that same length of neck. And then there is a giraffe born that has an even slightly longer neck. And it gives it a competitive advantage. And that, and that trait begins to propagate through the population, generation after generation after generation. So nature is selecting upon that. So the environment says, hey, that gives you an advantage. You do better, you reproduce more, you pass that trait on at a higher rate than other organisms. But I'll say a giraffe is born where it has a mutation where its front limbs are shorter than its hind limbs. It makes it cumbersome for it to move around. Right? It has a hard time, it has a hard time reaching leaves. That draft is probably not going to do very well. Right? That draft is not likely to reproduce a lot. And so that trait, that mutation, will be selected against. And so it, it won't propagate through the uh, population generation after generation. It'll be kind of you know, snuffed out of the genetic gene pool. So this is like when uh, you know, Darwin and um, Sir Alfred Wallace both independently came up with the idea of natural selection as the mechanism that drives evolution in, in, in organisms. It says it's not survival of the strongest. That's it's the survival of the fittest. Okay? And fit being fit could mean being well camouflaged. Being fit could mean being disguising yourself uh, so you look like some other organism that might be poisonous. Being fit might be have being very fast, being able to catch prey. So uh, being fit depends on what you do in your environment. So that could take a wide a number of meanings depending on what environment the organism is in. So according to evolution, driven by natural selection, the environment that an organism lives in isn't right for that organism, right? The Arctic fox doesn't live in the Arctic because its fur is white. The organism is right for the environment. The Arctic fox, Arctic fox's fur is white because it lives in the Arctic. Okay, it's not the other way around. You know, the Arctic fox wasn't living in Florida. I'd be like, hey, I'm going to move north so I can blend in a lot better and catch prey a lot easier. No, no. It's over time. You know, these Arctic foxes had lighter and lighter coats, which gave it a slightly larger advantage over other Arctic foxes, so that was selected upon. Next thing you know, all Arctic foxes are white. Okay? So, random mutations occur in the population that create different variations, different traits within organisms. The environment selects upon those traits. Those that are successful get passed on through genetics to the next generation at a higher rate, 
and that trait that's favorable becomes ubiquitous within the species. Okay? Yes? So essentially, light changes to fit its environment? Right? Exactly. Okay. Life changes to fit its environment. That's why life is found almost everywhere on the planet, because life is resilient, right? Life is constantly changing to fit its environment. And it's not evolution. Some people say, oh, I don't believe in evolution. Evolution is not something you can or cannot believe in, right? It's like saying, I believe in the sun rising, because we can observe, and we do observe evolution. Um, we hear about these super bugs, these infections like MRSA and stuff that are, are antibiotic resistant, how do they become antibiotic resistant? We, we expose these bacteria to the antibiotics. We kill some them, but some of them survive. The ones that survive were the ones that had some resistance. They repopulate, and we kill some. And over time, the, the more we hit these bacteria with antibiotics, they evolve to it, and they become resistant. All right, and they, there, there's been experiments where they have bacteria in a petri dish. They hit it with ultraviolet light, and almost all the bacteria die. The few survive. They let them repopulate. They hit it with ultraviolet light again. Most of them die, but a couple more than the first time they repeat this process, and eventually, very few of the bacteria will die because they have evolved a resistance to the ultraviolet light. Yes. Now, along with that, we had talked about, not last week, but the week before, about evolution <coughs> and how apes kind of evolved almost, it seems, because the continents separated. Oh, hey, uh, yeah. And no. then they began to stand up because they were... Apes, yeah, that's just one theory. That's that's human human ancestors, but apes, there's a large number. There's, there's several different apes, right? There's, of the great apes, there's us, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, and orangutans. So, my, my big so that's the greater apes. Then there's the lesser apes, too. So apes is a big family of primates. Because that would be my question. If, that, if we did evolve from that, how come they're still not evolving now? They just stay... Well, well, mammals evolve from reptiles. And so that's like saying, why is there still reptiles? If mammals evolve from reptiles, why did reptiles go extinct? No, it's because life branches out. Just because a new species evolves doesn't mean the one you evolved from has to stop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, the vertebrate evolution is fish were the first vertebrates. Then from, from them off branched amphibians, from amphibians branched mammals, and then, uh, sorry, from amphibians branched reptiles, from off of reptiles branched mammals, and then later on off of reptiles branched birds. Okay. So it's a big tree of life. Okay, so organisms do not intend to evolve. Okay, it's not like, okay, you know, I need to, I need to change. Evolution is driven by the environment. Okay, it's guided by natural selection. Um, individuals do not evolve. So an organ, one organism does not evolve. Evolution occurs over long time cells. For for most organisms that don't reproduce very rapidly, like bacteria and so forth. Uh, populations of organisms evolve over time, okay? And so over large expanses of time, evolution can bring about significant changes in organisms. And that, that gradual change that occurs over large periods of time, which in geologic history, there's a lot of time. It's something that there's no lack of. That gradual change that accumulates over long periods of time brings about the diversity of life we find on on Earth. So remember I said that um, uh, mammals evolved from reptiles and reptiles evolved from amphibians. So the first reptiles evolved on land um, and then mammals, the first mammals evolved on land too. So the, the, the first mammals were terrestrial or land-dwelling organisms. Um, but we have marine mammals now, like whales, porpoises, dolphins, okay? uh, manatees. So some mammals have evolved back into the water. An example is a whale. So whales' ancestors are terrestrial mammals. So about 55 million years ago, there was a mammal that was probably living near the mouths of some rivers. 
and it was spending some time in the water, right? It was going into the water. Why was it going into the water? Maybe it was going in fishing, looking for food. Or maybe it was going into the water to avoid predators on land. For some reason, it was going into the water, and then coming out of the water. Going into the water, coming out of the water. Well, because this, because this mammal is spending a decent amount of time in the water over generations, random variations that brought about traits in those organisms that gave it a slight advantage to living in water were selected upon. And, and, and a group of those mammals, they, evolution kind of took them to the water and away from land. While another group, they kind of maintain that amphibious lifestyle of living in water and on land. And so that's where whales and hippos have a common ancestor. That, that, that mammal was kind of living in the water and on land. But the ancestors of hippos, they continued to, to do that. But the ancestors of whales, they began to, I, I say like they began to fully commit. They don't intend, to, they didn't intend to do it. I'm just saying that their evolution took them to uh, head along into the water. And so over time, they developed features. They lost their features that were advantageous for a terrestrial life and accumulated features that are advantageous for a marine life. And so, for example, let's just pack a cetus in the bottom right-hand corner here. That's a skeleton of pack a cetus. And this is uh, an artist's depiction of what pack a cetus might look like. Now, this is an ancestor of a whale. So it's a terrestrial mammal. Uh, you can see, like other terrestrial mammals, its its uh, four limbs and its high, its four limbs are connected to shoulders, uh, shoulder bones, which are connected to the spine, and the hind limbs are connected to the hips, which are connected to the spine, so it can support its body mass under the weight of force of gravity. Uh, and here is Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus is a descendant; it's an ancestor of whales. Right? but it's a descendant of Pachycetus. And so you can see changes have occurred through many generations going from Pachycetus to Ambulocetus. Okay, I don't know what that is. But anyways, so what features in the skeleton of Ambulocetus do you recognize as being advantageous for, for living in water? Just in the skeleton. Like what? How is it different from Pachycetus? How is Ambulocetus different from Pachycetus? It's what? It's kind of straight, right? It's it's straight because it's maybe more streamlined, right? More aerodynamic. That's the streamlined, right? Yeah, it has a bigger head. It's a bigger skull, right? That big skull would be a pain in the ass to haul around on land, right? <laughs> But because you're in water, you have buoyancy, it's not as hard. And why would you want to have a bigger skull? Well, because now you're trying to catch prey in three dimensions. All right? You're not just chasing prey on land where it can move in two dimensions. Now this prey can swim left, right, back, forth, or up and down. So having a larger mouth gives you a, a better opportunity to catch that prey. Yeah, Because, I mean, it, it is a predator, you can see from its teeth. So a larger skull to be able to have an easier time to catch prey. Uh, look at its digits. His digits are much longer. His digits are much longer because there was most likely webbing between them and they're acting as paddles. Yeah. And what about its rib cage? What about his rib cage is different? It's, um, longer. it's much bigger, right? Yeah. Why does it have a bigger rib cage? Lungs. Lung capacity, right? Lung capacity. You want to eat bigger lungs. Hold more air in them. Spend more time underwater. Because each time you have to come up and take a breath, your prey might get away, especially if your prey doesn't have to, if it's a fish. So it's so nature selected upon bigger lungs, bigger rib cage to facilitate those bigger lungs so it could spend more time, longer periods of time before taking breaths to increase its chances of catching whatever it's chasing, swimming after. Okay, here it's you see it's going up to that crab. But um, and looking at the ancestors of whales, we can see that the nostril migrated from the end of the snout, which 
in terrestrial mammals, the nostrils at the end of the snout. That's about 50 million years ago. 25 million years ago, you can see the nostril migrated from the end to the center, the middle of the skull. Until modern day whales, their nostril is at the top of the skull. That's the blowhole, right? And why? Well, if you have to stick your snout out above the water to take a breath, uh, it's not a really smooth motion, right? And if you're, you're, you're moving, you want to, just like a, an Olympic swimmer, right? You want to take that, that stroke, that motion where you take a breath between strokes, you want to make it as seamless as possible or else it's going to add time to your lap. So we want to, to these, want to make it seamless as possible to take a breath. And so that's why the nostril migrated to the top of the skull. So now it just has to skim the surface of the water. <sighs> Exhale. That's the, that's the blow. <sighs> Inhale and then go back under. Right? It's to take a breath in a seamless manner. So that's why the nostrils migrated from the end of the skull to the top of the skull. And you can see modern day whales, so this is a humpback whale, have these little tiny bones back here, right back here. Do you know what those are the remnants of? Not their feet, their hips. Their hips. These are called vestigial structures. These are structures that are no longer useful in the organism, but were fully functional in its ancestors. So it's hips. Whales and other marine mammals have lost their hind limbs. But there are these still little tiny hip bones in there that haven't completely disappeared. We have vestigial structures, right? We have tail bones. We don't have tails. Our ancestors had tails. Our cousins, quote, have tails. We have a tailbone. Uh, if, you, if you feel uh, the ridge of your ear, the cartilage in your ear, some people have a little, a little nub of cartilage right kind of in the center of the top out of the top ridge of your ear and that i have one right here i have one on the right ear not in the left ear and that cartilage is where a tendon connected to the edge of the ear and that tendon um, is what connected the muscle that ran from the back of the ear to the skull so that we could our ancestors could move their ears. You know how like dogs and cats will move their ears to focus to hear the sound? So our ancestors could do that. And so if you're, you know, a little less evolved like myself, you still might have that little. Other vestigial structures are your wisdom teeth, right? A lot of people's jawbone isn't even big enough for your wisdom teeth. And so when we had a less refined diet, we're eating more raw food. Uh, it was, it was a lot of wear in your teeth, so you had extra teeth where we don't need them, and we get them removed because sometimes they don't even grow fully in. They get impacted. Okay? So we have a bunch of vestigial structures. Uh, there's more that you know we don't really need or use now, but were fully functional in our ancestors. Okay? So evolution driven by natural selection explains how life has changed throughout time on earth in the ocean and we can see evidence of it in other places too uh, for example there's two types of evolution convergent evolution and divergent evolution and we're going to talk about convergent evolution a convergent evolution uh, occurs whenever you have organisms that aren't closely related but you they live in the same environment so the environment selects upon them in a similar way and so over time these animals that aren't closely related begin to resemble each other because they're living in the same environment that's selecting upon, it, selecting upon them the same way. So if you live in the ocean, you'll develop a streamlined body. You'll have paddles, right? Um, and so, for example, you have a shark, which is a fin. Uh, sorry, fin. It's a, it's a fish. This is ichthyosaur. It's an extinct reptile. It was, a, it was a marine reptile. This is a penguin, and this is a dolphin. All have streamlined bodies. All have fins or flippers. They all have similar features because they all live in the water. They all swim through the water, and so nature is selected upon them in a similar way, so they have developed these similarities. So they look similar, 
even though they're not closely related to one another. So that's an example of convergent evolution. And so uh, we classify life in the ocean based upon our, or, or life in general, based upon its evolutionary heritage. So we use a system of classification called the natural system, uh, and where uh, organisms are put in these levels of classification based upon their uh, similarities. This is also called the Linnaeus system of classification because uh, Charles Linnaeus, I think his name is Charles, is the one who developed it. Okay, so this is where we have like the kingdom, the phylum, the families, genus. Okay, that's the natural system of, of um, classification. And so we have uh, two distinct groups, the prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The prokaryotes include the bacteria and archaea. So these are small single cellular organisms with no distinct compartments, okay, prokaryotic organisms. Then we have the eukaryotes, eukarya, all organisms that have a nucleus in the cells. Most eukaryotic organisms are multicellular, meaning the organism consists of multiple cells instead of just one. So uh, examples of eukaryotes are animals, plants, fungi, and protists. Okay, if one word a protist is, algae are protists. So seaweed is nothing but algae, and so seaweed is a protist. Seaweed is not a plant. So these are the, basically three domains of life. You have bacteria and archaea, those are prokaryotes, and then you have eukaryotes, are those organisms whose cells have a nucleus. And if we look at, say, an example, uh, look at a, at a seagull, we can put it in these levels of classification. So here you see these categories running down here, kingdom, phylum, subphylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And there's and so the kingdoms, the various kingdoms, we have animalia, plants, protists, monera, these are very general groupings of organisms. So for example, an animal is any eukaryotic multicellular organism that eats food and reproduces sexually, okay? That's an animal, pretty general, right? But then within animals, you have different phylum. So a phylum is the next level of organization. You have different types of animals, like you have arthropods. Those are organisms that have no, no, no spinal cord. They don't have an internal skeleton. They have an exoskeleton, and they have a segmented body, like insects. Uh, arachnids, crustaceans, okay, any of the echinoderms like sea urchins and um, starfish. Then you have uh, Snendera, uh, which are you know jellyfish and so forth. Then you have chordates. Chordates are all those animals that have a central, or a dorsal nerve, okay, or a central nerve running down through their body, the spinal cord. And then of chordates, you have uh, a subphylum called vertebrates. And those are all chordates that have basically bone protecting that spinal cord, a, a, a spine, a backbone. So vertebrates are all animals with a backbone. So you have different classes of vertebrates, mammals, reptiles, fish, birds. And then you have different, so for example, if you look at birds, aves, you have different orders of birds, right? Uh, so this is a little bit more specific. And then with each order, we have families of birds within each order. So this is even more specific. Within each family, we have genuses of birds, which are even more specific. And finally, within genuses, we have species. And the species is the lowest level of classification. This actually identifies the individual organism. And a species is defined as a group of organisms <laughs> that can reproduce and create um, fertile offspring. So for example, ever hear of a liger? Yeah, yeah. A, mix a, of lion and a tiger. It's a mix of a lion and a tiger. So a lion and a tiger can breed and produce offspring. But a liger is not fertile. It's, it's sterile because it's considered a hybrid. So a liger itself cannot reproduce. And that's how you know lions and tigers 
are different species. Same thing with a whale fin, right? A mix of a, a whale and a dolphin. Or what about a, a donkey, oh, a mule? A mule is a hybrid between a horse and a donkey. And so a mule is, horses and donkeys are a different species. And so a mule is sterile. It's not fertile. They cannot reproduce. Okay. A coyote and dog. A coyote and dog, different species. They could reproduce, right. but their offspring is not fertile. Dogs evolve. Dogs are all the same species. That's why you can breed two different breeds of dogs, right? They're different, not different species of dogs, like like a Shih Tzu and a Chihuahua. You can breed them, and their offspring is fertile because they're all the same species. So the common dog, even though they take a because uh, they're because through artificial selection, they have people have brought about all these different species. I mean, not species breeds, but they're still all the same species. So if you let all these different species, I should keep saying species, all these different breeds of dogs, you know, a Great Dane, a Beagle, let them all interbreed. You know, after generations, the result will be the ancestral dog that looks like a wolf, right? ancestral dog but we've selected we've bred certain dogs together to select upon traits and have produced these breeds through selective breeding so that's not natural selection that's called artificial selection and we do the same thing with plants that's how we cultivate plants and 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 and, and make plants uh, kind of way that we want them to by selecting plants that have traits that we like and breeding them together so that trait you know to accentuate those traits and so it's artificial selection as well. So here's an example of uh, the uh, natural or Linnaean classification of a particular species, uh, a coyote. Right. So you have the kingdom phylum, subphylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so the kingdom is Animalia. So this is a multicellular organism. Cells have a nucleus, the eukaryotes. They reproduce sexually, and they ingest preformed organic molecules, also known as food, right? Um, they're chordates. That means they have that central nerve, that notochord, okay? They're vertebrates. They have the segmented vertebral column around that notochord. They're mammals. They're warm-blooded, have hair, fur, hair or fur, and mammary glands. They're of the order carnivora. They're mammals whose teeth are specialized for a uh, strictly meat diet. They're in a family, Canidae, which are dog-like carnivores, including domestic dogs, wolves, coyotes, and foxes. Genus Canis, made up of related species of domestic dogs, wolves, and coyotes. And finally, the species Latrans. Uh, these are just coyotes, right? So, 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 for example, domestic dogs and coyotes are in the same genus, right? They're different species of the same genus. So they're closely related. They share a fairly recent evolutionary ancestor, which they diverged from. And here we can uh, compare four different species and see their evolutionary heritage, right? All four of these, the Homo sapien, the, uh, well, the, the human, the polar bear, the blue jay, and the crocodile, they're all animals, right? So they all descend from some ancestral animal. They're all chordates. So they all descend from some ancestral chordate. But here's where they split, okay? So um, the class is different among these four. So the class of humans and the polar bear is the same, mammals. That means that humans share a more recent common evolutionary ancestor, polar bears, some ancestral mammal, okay, than they do with crocodile or a blue jay. That means that humans are more closely related to polar bears and they are blue jays or reptiles. But you see that after the class, uh, and then at the level of order, humans split from polar bears, right? Humans are some different evolutionary branch and polar bears came from another evolutionary branch that came off of mammals. So humans are primates where, uh, or polar bears came from a lineage of mammals that are carnivora. Right. 
So and so forth. And then then primates, you know, they differentiated into different uh, families, and those families differentiated into different genuses and, and, and so forth. So you can see uh, evolutionary uh, heritage in these natural classifications of organisms. So evolution explains how life on Earth changes. Okay, but now we're going to focus on uh, energy. Because energy is extremely important to life. Without energy, you don't have life. And the reason why is uh, things that are alive, we call them organisms. And in that word, organism, is the word basically organized. And so organisms are very organized, right? Look at us. We have these different systems, like our skeletal system, our circulatory system. Within those systems, we have different organs. Then there's organs with different tissues. So it's very well organized. But nature doesn't like, I shouldn't say doesn't like. Nature, its preferred state is not one in which that is organized. Nature tends to states that are poorly organized. And uh, entropy is the measure of disorder in a system. Okay, so if something is very disordered, it has a high amount of entropy. If something's very organized, it has a low amount of entropy. And nature tends to states of high entropy. Right? For example, if you knock a glass of milk off the table, it breaks, right? It went from low to high entropy. How do you get that from uh, high entropy, very disordered, fragments of glass and milk all over? Before, it takes, you have to put energy back into the system to reorganize it, right? So if you think about it, I, you know, because I've studied science for a long time, my mother, I used to argue with my mother all the time, tell me, clean my room, clean my room, clean my room. I tell my mother, my poor mother, that I'm literally fighting the universe, right? The universe tends to a state of high entropy. My room's going to get dirty no matter how many times I clean it. If I clean it, I have to put energy into it, right? I have to organize it. So it decreases its entropy. I gotta, you have to put energy in to organize it. But if you let it go, we don't put any energy into it, what happens to it? It's a mess. It becomes a mess, right? It tends back to that state of high entropy. It's going to happen every, every, every single time. You clean it, get dirty. You clean it, get dirty. You clean it, get dirty. And I told her that Albert Einstein then said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So, but she didn't accept any of those arguments, which I thought were very good arguments, right? But um, she, she didn't accept um, my, 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 my poor mother. Yeah. But anyways, so to decrease the entropy of a system, in other words, to add order, you need to add energy to the system. Organisms are organized, so to remain organized, they need energy. Okay? What happens if you don't have any more energy? Say, we're, our source of energy is food, right? If you quit eating, what happens to you? You perish. You perish. You die. Right? Because you fall apart. You literally fall apart. Because you need the energy to stay organized. Your body literally begins to just fall apart. Your, your bodily functions no longer operate. And it's like you can't, your body can't keep itself together anymore. And you perish. So most of the energy used by marine organisms uh, to make food comes from the sun. Okay? And so this energy used, uh, the primary source of energy for life in the ocean is sun. Is the sun. And the process in which Energy from the sun is converted into organic matter. It's known as photosynthesis. Okay, photosynthesis. It's a process used by most producers. We'll talk about the producers in a second to convert the sun's energies. Sorry, the sun's energy to food energy, carbohydrates. So we eat food energy, carbohydrates. That's why if you read read your food label, it tells you how much energy is in it. And the number of calories. Remember we talked about calories and heat capacity? By well, your food label has calories. 
That's how much energy is in that food. It's a different type of energy. It's chemical potential energy, but still no less energy. And so chemosynthesis is another process that synthesizes food, but it uses uh, um, chemical compounds, and it breaks apart those chemical compounds and takes the energy released from the breaking apart of those chemical compounds to make food. Okay? And I wonder, like, well, how is energy from light from the sun used to make food? Okay? Well, there are several things required in photosynthesis. So the input is basically, if you ignore nutrients, because everything needs nutrients, like a plant won't grow unless it has nutrients. You can give it all these things, but it needs nutrients. But if you ignore nutrients, you need carbon dioxide, water, and light. And so what a plant does is it takes the energy from the light and it breaks these molecules apart. It breaks the carbon away from the oxygen and CO2, and it breaks the hydrogen away from the oxygen and water. Then it reorganizes them. It bonds the carbon to a bunch of hydrogen and oxygen and forms what's known as a carbohydrate. And then what's left over is some oxygen, and it gives off the oxygen. So um, photosynthesis absorbs carbon dioxide. It uses that carbon in the carbon dioxide to make hydrocarbons, which it, the organism makes its body out of. And then it gives that oxygen back to the atmosphere. So, so a carbohydrate is really carbon with hydrogen. The carbon comes from carbon dioxide. The hydrogen comes from water. And so when you see a tree, all the carbon and hydrogen that makes up that tree, the actual wood, that carbon was once where? In the atmosphere, right? It was once a gas floating in the atmosphere. And it, it ripped that carbon off the CO2 molecule. It ripped the hydrogen from the water molecule, put them together, make a carbohydrate, and make his body out of it, okay? So essentially it creates a nutrient? No, so it needs nutrients because it, need, it, it that's just the basic stuff, right? That's just the basic stuff for photosynthesis to perform other life processes. Like so, for example, we eat food, but we need other materials besides just food. The food is the source of energy, but so for example, our nervous system works. So, uh, it needs to be it's electrical impulses. So we need materials that can conduct electricity, like electrolytes. We talked about salinity, right? So if we don't consume those inorganic materials, that we call them vitamins and minerals, like sodium and, and potassium, our body, our, our body can't work. So, so those, those are considered nutrients, stuff that's not necessarily like um, it's not the energy. It's not, the, it's not what we're actually making our body out of. Yeah. But it's essential for bodily functions. And also carbohydrates. Well, carbohydrates are the food you eat that are energy, yeah. right? Exactly. So they're energy. So we eat, we eat carbohydrates. And our body breaks them apart and extracts that energy. And that's the energy we use to move around, to eat our bodies, and do everything with. Okay? Chemosynthesis, same thing. Or it takes carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, uh, and it breaks the chemical bonds of, 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 of chemicals in the ocean, and it, that releases energy, which then it uses to reorganize carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide to make carbohydrates, and it produces sulfates as a metabolic byproduct. But you talk, you hear about, going back to photosynthesis, how plants, they absorb CO2 and they release oxygen. That's the process of photosynthesis, right? Where we eat food, in order to eat food, you have to combust it, basically. So whenever uh, a carbohydrate is heated up, uh, say any organic material is a carbohydrate. So say if you have a piece of wood, you heat it up, heat it up, heat it up, that piece of wood will not burn, will not begin to, the energy won't be released from those carbohydrates unless there is oxygen there. Because what happens is the carbohydrate reacts with the oxygen in what's called combustion. 
And that is an exothermic reaction in which heat is produced. Energy is released. So the carbohydrate is stored energy in that molecule. And whenever you react that molecule with oxygen, the energy is released. So that's why animals have to breathe in oxygen because we need that oxygen to metabolize our food, to oxidize our food, to extract the energy from it. It's literally almost the same process of it's combustion, right, oxidation except we call it metab metabolism, right? We, metabolize, we, we oxidize the carbohydrates, the hydrocarbons that we eat to extract the energy from them. So that's why, you know, if you don't have oxygen, you die because you're not able to, you, you run out of energy. You could, you could be on eating food, right? But if you're in a room with no oxygen, you, you can't use that food, right? You can't metabolize it. And for, for mammals, we have to constantly metabolize something, right? If we haven't recently eat food, then we tap into the reserves, and we begin to oxidize the reserves. So the flow of energy through life on Earth. So life root source of energy is basically the sun. So light energy from the sun. Photosynthesizers like green plants on land, algae, and specialized bacteria in the ocean. They use that light from the sun to create their bodies, which are organic, organic molecules, carbohydrates, right? Plants create their bodies using light from the sun, carbon dioxide and water. So their bodies are hydrocarbons, carbohydrates, organic molecules. And so photosynthesizers create organic molecules from inorganic materials, carbon dioxide and water using the light from the sun. So photosynthesizers create carbohydrates, which are which have energy stored in them, because it took energy to make them. The energy is from the sun. So consumers, they consume those organic molecules that have the stored energy in them. They metabolize, they oxidize that food to extract the energy from them, to fuel their bodies. And they they move around the energy that they use to live their life. It goes into movement, the creation of heat, the waste, right? You know, I waste some of that energy uh, doing a lot of things, right? So we're all using that energy right now. So where did all the energy that we're currently using, like the energy I'm using to lift this, the, the ultimate source of this energy was the sun, right? Because something absorbed its sun, photosynthesized, made its body out of it, maybe a piece of say, uh, a wheat plant, it made a, a seed that was later bro broken down into flour, which I ate in a piece of bread this morning, and now I'm oxidizing that bread, and I'm metabolizing the bread to use, to use that energy to lift this, right? So the ultimate source of energy is the sun. Even fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are nothing but coal, just plants, and and, and petroleum, crude oil, is uh, photosynthetic plankton or cyanobac, uh, photosynthetic plankton we'll talk about, which all of that organic material, those carbohydrates or hydrocarbons, are formed by photosynthesis. Okay. So, primary producers, these are organisms that make organic matter. So they are the photosynthesizers chemosynthesizers. So primary productivity is the synthesis of organic materials from inorganic substances through the processes of photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Okay? And any organism that does this is known as a primary producer. So primary producers, they are the ones that take most of the energy from the sun and make organic matter out of it. So plants, for example. Algae and in the ocean, most primary production is due to these organisms known as phytoplankton, photosynthetic plankton. 90 to 96 percent of photosynthesis or primary production is due to phytoplankton. Okay, so uh, a molecule used in photosynthesis is chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is green. It's what makes the leaves of plant green. And so remember we looked at chlorophyll concentration in the water, if you remember that? 
that's looking at biographical activity because if chlorophyll is in the water, that molecule, if it's in the water, that means photosynthesis is happening in the water. If photosynthesis is happening in the water, primary productivity is happening in the water. So seaweeds contribute about 2 to 5% of primary product, uh, production in the ocean. So this primary uh, production occurs in water, seabed sediments, it even occurs in solid rock from what are known as extremophiles, bacteria and archaea that live under extreme conditions. They can, uh, they, uh, they are responsible for 2 to 5% of primary productivity. These primary producers are the bottom of the food chain. That's not a bad place to be. It sounds bad bottom. They are the foundation of the food chain. If they go, everything else goes. They take energy from the sun and convert it into organic matter that everything else eats. Okay? That's how the dinosaurs went extinct. The meteorite hit the planet, send up a bunch of debris into the atmosphere, blotted out the sun, blotted the vegetation died. Primary produ productivity on Earth, on, on land, tank. It didn't completely disappear with tank. So these large herbivores, like triceratops, and so forth, they need to eat a lot. But in those vegetation, these primary producers are now gone. They're, 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 they're not very abundant. And so the herbivores, they die. Now all the herbivores are dying, have died. What dies next? Carnivores. The carnivores. And so the dinosaurs went extinct. They weren't all killed by the meteorite. They were killed because the meteorite decreased primary productivity on land. And so it knocked out the, the bottom of what's called the trophic pyramid form took a significant blow and it, that, that, that rippled up. So uh, what this indicates is that the human race will be extinct. <laughs> why? Because of things that... Well, if something would ever happen to primary productivity on Earth, exactly. in the ocean and land, exactly. not just humans, exactly. everything won't go extinct. Because dinosaurs didn't fully go extinct. Dinosaurs are still alive today. But but they'll take a significant blow, right? A lot of species will go extinct. Do you foresee something happening? No, no, I don't no, think so. Yeah. So, um, so scientists, they, they measure this primary productivity in the uh, amount of the, the, the grams. So grams is a measure of mass. The amount of carbon measured in grams that's bounded into organic molecules, carbohydrates, per square meter of, the, of some surface per year. So it's the amount of carbon being bound into organic molecules per square meter per year. That's how we measure primary productivity. So it has units of grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And total ocean uh, primary productivity it ranges between, on average, this is average, 75 to 100 grams of carbon are bound into carbohydrates per meter squared per year in the ocean. Okay? So this is the actual the average amount of primary, primary productivity that occurs in the ocean. So if that number decreases, things get bad. Right? Because there's no food. And it ripples up the food chain with the trophic pyramid. So here we see these phytoplankton. This is a diatom. It's a very common type of, uh, most productive type of phytoplankton. It takes CO2, takes water, light from the sun, and it forms glucose, a hydrocarbon, right? And so we measure a primary productivity of how many grams of carbon. So this carbon was taken from inorganic carbon dioxide carbon is taken from inorganic carbon dioxide and bound into or an organic molecule, glucose, by this diatom. Now this molecule is what it's inside its body. It made its body. That's what its body is made out of. Okay? And so it's the grams of carbon bound into organic molecules per square meter per year. That's how we measure primary productivity in the ocean. Okay? Any questions? So this is uh, primary productivity in different parts of uh, the planet. So we have uh, ocean communities and land communities. So coral reefs are 
uh, some of the most productive uh, communities uh, on the planet. So they range from 880 to 2,200 grams carbon per meter square per year. And you have kelp beds, shelf plankton, then the open ocean. You see the open ocean actually has very little productivity compared to other locations. Then land communities, you have rainforests, very productive, temperate forests, very productive, freshwater swamps, and cropland, very productive. And you can see if you average all the productivity of the ocean, it comes out to an average of 120. And if you average all the productivity of land, it comes out to an average of 150. So per square meter, land is actually more productive. There's more biological productivity or primary productivity on land than there is ocean. But there's a lot more of the ocean than there is land. So the vast majority of primary productivity on Earth occurs in the ocean. You take this number and multiply it by the surface area of the ocean. Take this number and multiply it by the surface area of land, right? And we know that there's about 70% ocean and about 30 percent land. So primary productivity in the ocean is responsible for the majority of primary productivity in, 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 in a, on Earth. Okay, So the ocean and the primary productivity that occurs in it is extremely important to the Earth. And if something would happen to it, that would, the effects of it would ripple all throughout life on, on the planet. Okay. So here's a map of primary productivity. Uh, so the ye red, yellow, and green areas indicate high primary productivity, where blue areas indicate low primary productivity. And now notice that the open tropical oceans have very low primary productivity. Why? They're deep. Because they're deep. We talked about this. Because of what? Mm -mm. So low latitudes near the tropics where the water is very warm. What happens to the water? It's like oh, the no, the tr no There's no vertical mixing because the water is stratified. Water, so the, the biological uh, life doesn't get affected by the nutrients. Exactly. Uh, because the surface water is so warm, there's a large thermocline. Because there's a large thermocline, there's a large pycnocline. Because there's a large pycnocline, there's a large density difference between the surface and bottom water, so the water can't vertically mix, just as you said. And so primary producers, they exhaust all the nutrients in that surface water, and they, they, they don't exist because there's no more nutrients. So primary productivity in those open tropical waters where the water stratified is very low. There's a large amount along the near the equator, that's where the ITCZ is, right? Where the converging easterly winds drive that upwelling, which brings nutrient-rich water to the surface. There's a lot of primary productivity along the coastlines. Remember, remember we looked at this? The winds drive this upwelling along this coastline, which is why we have a lot of primary productivity here. We have a lot of primary productivity along the coastline where rivers flush nutrients from land into water. And we have a lot of primary productivity at high latitude where there's not a large thermocline because the surface water is, is similar in temperature to the deeper water. So there is vertical mixing bringing nutrients to the surface. Okay, And so a lot of the things we talked about on uh, so far in this course influence where primary productivity occurs on Earth. So where primary productivity occurs on Earth um, has many factors uh, that that uh, at play that influence it. So the food web or the trophic pyramid is how energy gets dispersed through communities. So energy comes into the food web from light from the sun. Then autotrophs are all those organisms that make their own food. They're also called producers. Then heterotrophs are all those organisms that consume other organisms for energy, okay? So they don't make their own food, they have to eat other organisms. And the trophic pyramid is this model that describes basically who eats whom. 
in this trophic pyramid, you have primary consumers. They're the ones that eat the producers. You have secondary consumers. They're the organisms that eat the primary consumers. And you have top consumers. They're the ones that nothing eats them. They eat everything, right? So what are some examples? Can you guys think of some examples, either on land or in the ocean? What is, say, for example, uh, on land, what is a primary consumer? Something that eats producers. Yeah. A bear? Well, maybe partly if it's eating berries and stuff, because berries are plants and plants are producers. But bears also are consumers at the same time because they eat other animals. They eat other consumers. A, a whale? So, 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 sorry, sorry, bears are primary consumers in that they eat plants, but they're also secondary consumers because they eat other animals. A whale? Well, it depends on what type of whale. If it's um, a baleen whale, yeah. it's eating mostly plankton. It is, uh, there's two types of plankton. There is zoo, uh, phytoplankton that are producers, and there's zooplankton that are primary consumers. They eat the phytoplankton. Yeah. Krill is an example of a zooplankton. It's a primary consumer. It eats the phytoplankton. And then the whales eat the zoo eat the zooplankton. So whales are technically considered probably secondary consumers because they're eating the zooplankton. Oh, okay. But say like a cow, right? A cow eats nothing but producers. So a cow is a primary consumer. It's eating nothing but producers. Grass. Right? And then something that eats a cow would be considered a secondary consumer because it's eating a primary consumer. Then anything that eats that Thing that eats the cow is still a secondary consumer until you get to the top of the food chain. Like humans, we're top consumers. What eats humans? Fires. Yeah, <laughs> nothing really, right? We're the top consumers. And in the ocean, say like um, a sperm whale, right? A sperm whale, nothing really eats a sperm whale. It's a top consumer. An orca, a killer whale, nothing really eats a killer whale. It's a top consumer. A great white shark, nothing really eats a great white shark. It's a top consumer, right? A seal, though, is a secondary consumer. It, eat, it eats fish, right? And then something eats it. Fish are secondary consumers. They eat smaller fish, and then something eats them, all right? And the little tiny fish, if you get tiny enough, uh, they're still secondary consumers because they might be eating zooplankton. But the zooplankton, the little tiny little tiny animals like krill, they are primary consumers because they only eat the producers in the ocean, the phytoplankton. How about ants? Ants? Yeah. Ants are consumer. They eat they eat preformed organic molecules. So they 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 um, they're not producers, obviously they're animals. And I mean I don't know. I don't know if they eat mostly plants or if they eat decaying. Oh they eat everything in the house. Yeah so so they're probably like a bear, right? They're they're both a, pri a secondary consumer and a, an elephant, uh, they would be a primary consumer because they eat nothing but producers, plants. Yeah. So, so this is a generalized trophic pyramid. In the tro trophic pyramid, it basically shows how energy and biomass is transferred up the food web. So in general, an organism has to eat about 10 times its mass to sustain life. So that means 10% of the biomass at a given level of the trophic pyramid gets transferred up to the next level. In other words, say you had, uh, you know, you eat a tuna sandwich, right? It has one, 100 grams of tuna, a quarter pound of tuna in it. Well, what went into making that tuna? Well, for the actual tuna fish, for each, for every one kilogram of that tuna's mass, it had to eat roughly 10 kilograms of mid-sized fish, the fish it eats, okay? Had to eat about 10 times its mass. So for every one kilogram of its mass, so let's say it's, I don't know, 50 kilograms, 
the entire tuna, it would have had to eat 500 kilograms of mid-sized fish. So for every one kilogram of tuna, it has to eat 10 kilograms of mid-sized fish. Those 10 kilograms of mid-sized fish, they have to eat 1,000 kilograms of small fish. And those 1,000 kilograms, sorry, sorry, 100 kilograms of small fish. Those 100 kilograms of small fish have to eat 1,000 kilograms of small herbivores, these zooplankton, like krill. And these small zooplankton, they have these 1,000 kilograms of zooplankton have to eat about 10,000 kilograms of phytoplankton, primary producers. So <clears throat> since, uh, since, you know, if your tuna sandwich is 100 grams, 100 grams is one-tenth of a kilogram, right? So uh, if it takes 10,000 kilograms of primary producers, phytoplankton, to make one kilogram, take one-tenth of it, for that one gram of 100 grams of tuna, it took 1,000 kilograms of phytoplankton to make that, okay? So each level, about 10%, where does the rest of it go? If only 10% of the biomass transfers up, where does the rest of it go? It's converted into energy that's used by the organisms, right? So we eat food. What that means is 10% of the food we eat goes into making, 10% of the mass of the food we eat goes into making our actual bodies. 90% goes into the energy that we use, okay? That's what it basically means. And so... And so, you, you know, we have to eat, you know, about 10 times our body mass in order to sustain life in general, right? And so 10% of the biomass is transferred up to each level of the trophic pyramid. So this is a simplified food web of basically who eats who. So here you have the base. These are the primary producers, phytoplankton. And you have secondary consumers. Uh, sorry, primary consumers, the zooplankton. They're the ones that eat the primary producers. Then you have, then you have all these consumers, these secondary consumers, because they eat the primary consumers. So whales, um, uh, birds, fish. Okay. Then you have other secondary consumers that eat those secondary consumers. And then you have a top consumer, right? The, the top consumer that eats other secondary consumers, but nothing eats it. So all this energy uh, comes into the biosphere from these guys taking light from the sun and turning it into their bodies. And then all these organisms eat, you know, these organisms eat those, and these organisms eat these, and these organisms eat those. So it just transfers up until the buck stops at the top consumer, right? Nothing eats the top consumer. All right. So now we're going to talk about different environmental factors that influence life in the ocean. And so um, one group of factors are known as physical factors. And uh, physical factors, uh, they're any aspect of the physical environment that affects organisms. Uh, and some examples of physical factors are the amount of light, the amount of dissolved gases, the temperature of the water. The acid-base balance of the water, is the water too acidic, is it too basic? The salinity of the water, the hydrostatic pressure of the water, so if you're shallow, you're low pressures, you're deep, you're high pressures, and the amount of dissolved nutrients, right? And these physical factors can act as a limiting factor. And a limiting factor is any physical factor that's found in that environment in a quantity that is too large or too little to the point, it's too big or too small to the point that it negatively influences life, right? So for example, dissolved nutrients are a limiting factor in the open tropical waters. There's too little of it, right? So there's no biological productivity. Where dissolved nutrients are not a limiting factor in the higher latitude waters near the poles where there's vertical mixing. Light is a limiting factor once you go to a certain depth, there's not enough light for photosynthesis. So light becomes a limiting factor for photosynthesis. Dissolved gases. Sometimes there's fish and clam kills in the bay. 
because the water becomes oxygen depleted and the fish and the clams, they, they asphyxiate, they die. So in those cases, dissolved oxygen becomes a limiting factor. The temperature, the temperature can rise and actually rising sea temperature, rising ocean temperatures are causing coral to die. Okay, and that's, that temperature is acting as a limiting factor. Are you an adapt swimmer? I can, I can, are you asking me if I'm a good swimmer? Yeah. Uh, I can swim in a swimming pool. Oh, that's it? Yeah, I can oh, swim in the ocean too, but if the waves are large enough, then I get scared. <laughs> so, we're going to talk about light in the ocean, because light can be a, 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 a limiting factor, a limiting physical factor. So we separate the different depths of the ocean into zones based upon how much light is there and what can be done with that light. So in general, the photic zone is the uppermost layer of, of seawater that is lit to any extent by the sun. Okay, And below the photic zone is the aphotic zone. This is the, this is the part of the ocean that no light from the sun reaches. It's permanently dark, also known as the midnight zone. It's dark all day, every day, 365 days in the year. This is always dark, perpetually dark. So you have the photic zone, the lit part of the ocean, the uppermost layer of the ocean, and the aphotic zone. You can see here this is, uh, this is the open, clear open ocean water. The photic zone on average extends down to about 600 meters, 2,000 feet deep. But in coastal ocean waters, the photic zone only extends down to 100 meters or 330 feet deep. Why the discrepancy? Why does the photic zone extend to such a large depth in open ocean water and not in coastal ocean waters? Well, what's going on in coastal ocean waters that really doesn't happen in open ocean waters due to a limiting factor that is the amount of dissolved nutrients in the water. Are there more nutrients in the open ocean, in open tropical oceans, or in coastal waters? Coastal. Coastal. So there's more, more life, right, in coastal waters. Also, because it's closer to the coast, there's going to be more sediment in coastal waters. So the light, life, there are organisms that are absorbing light and making food out of them. You have sediment that's scattering light. And so you have much more stuff in the water. You have more life, you have more sediment in the water, coastal waters. And so that light gets scattered or absorbed fairly readily, and so the light doesn't make it that deep into the water. So that's why the photic zone is shallower in coastal waters than it is open ocean water, open ocean. Because there's very little sediment and there's very little life, there's really nothing, not that much, besides water itself to absorb or scatter the light. So the light goes down to a pretty significant depth before it's all absorbed or scattered. Okay, uh, <clears throat> And so that's why the photo zone extends to a larger depth in open ocean, clear open ocean waters than it does coastal waters. Okay, And so then we divide the photic zone into two separate zones. The uppermost part of the photic zone is known as the euphotic zone. And on average, it extends down to about 70 meters or 230 uh, feet deep. And the photic, uh, sorry, the euphotic zone is the uppermost layer of the water where there is enough light for photosynthesis. Okay, so the euphotic zone extends down to the depth where there's enough light for photosynthesis. And so the majority of biological or primary productivity that occurs on Earth occurs in the euphotic zone of the ocean, the uppermost layer of the ocean where there's enough light for photosynthesis. Okay, and so it represents 1% of the total volume of the ocean, but nearly all of sea life and probably most of land life depends upon the primary productivity that occurs in it. Okay. Below the euphotic zone, you have what's called the dysphotic zone. It's still part of the photic zone. So there's still light. There's just not enough light for photosynthesis. 
However, there is enough light for vision. Okay, and so organisms, consumers use this vision to hunt with. You know, they use it to find prey and so forth. And so below the dysphotic zone, we leave the photic zone and enter the aphotic zone, which, uh, which is pretty much the bulk of the ocean. The bulk of the ocean is pitch black, right? Uh, it's part of, in, in the aphotic zone. But in the photic zone, we have the uppermost part, the euphotic zone, enough light for photosynthesis. And below that, the dysphotic zone, where there's only enough light for vision and not enough light for photosynthesis. And so, um, uh, but organisms live in, in all different zones. Organisms do live in the aphotic zone. Temperature also influences life. It can be a limiting factor. Because you know how, you know, if you put a piece of wood out, it doesn't begin to burn, right? Even though there's oxygen in the air. Why? Because the, that chemical reaction of the carbohydrates reacting with the oxygen in what we call combustion, it takes a certain amount of energy for it to begin. Okay? So in order to utilize the energy stored in carbohydrates by oxidizing them, you need a certain amount of ambient energy, temperature. The same thing is true in organisms, right? To metabolize their food in, 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 uh, in heterotrophs, organisms that eat food. For them to metabolize their food, they need some ambient energy, some, some temperature. And so how warm an animal's body is depends on how, de determines how fast they metabolize their food and what rate they're able to oxidize their food and extract the energy from it. So the, meta the metabolic rate of an organism, the rate at which they metabolize or use their food, it increases with temperature. Most marine organisms are ectothermic, which means they do not produce their own body heat, and that the body temperature of the organism is the same temperature as their environment. And so they cannot control their temperature, so, that, so the, the rate at which they metabolize their food is determined by the temperature of their surroundings. So the metabolic rate of an organism roughly doubles with uh, increase in temperature of 10 degrees centigrade, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, example, why do reptiles sun themselves? You know how a reptile suns themselves? To warm up. To warm up. They're ectothermic. And why do they need to warm up? Cold-blooded. They're cold-blooded, but why can't they just remain cold? Why do they want to warm their bodies? To get energy. So they, by warming their bodies, they increase their body temperature. And by, as they increase their body temperature, they increase the rate at which they can metabolize their food and actually use the energy in the food they ate. Oh, okay. Does it make it blood circulate? No. Well, their whole body functions slow down when they get cold. But there could be a nice juicy mouse that walks right in front of a snake. But if it's cold, it can have a full stomach but it can't metabolize that food because it's cold. It has to wait till its body warms up before that food, that oxidation reaction between the oxygen and the food can actually occur and it can actually extract energy from its food. Okay? So organisms that are cold-blooded, that live in cold environments, have very low metabolic rates, very slow metabolisms. Okay? Which you can see that puts reptiles at a disadvantage, right? Say if you're not the predator, say you're the prey. Say if you're a little lizard and some mammal comes walking by, if you're cold, you might not be able to use, you might not have the energy to run away, right? Because you're cold, you can't metabolize your food. You can't extract energy from your food. So, whoop, you get picked up and eat. So there's a disadvantage to that. Where mammals and birds, they came up with a solution to that problem they make their own body heat. They're what's said to be endothermic. So mammals, birds, and a few fishes are endothermic. And the, ad, and the advantage of that is that because you produce your own body heat, you maintain a constant temperature, 
you can metabolize your food at a constant rate. So you don't find yourself just laying on a rock cold, not being able to move. And that means that mammals can move into cold environments because they maintain their body temperature and they can metabolize their food. You don't see reptiles living in the Arctic, right? Because they never be warm enough to metabolize their food, but mammals do. The disadvantage is it costs more energy to make your own heat, right? So mammals have to, and birds have to eat more food so that they can produce that heat. But they have that, they have their own furnace so they can have, they can metabolize their food all the time. They don't, they're not subject to their external temperature, okay, when it comes to, they're not at the mercy of their ex external temperature when it comes to metabolizing their food. And so the rate of living, the pace of living kind of mirrors the metabolic rate. So tortoises live very long times, right? Because they have such low metabolic rate. Their life process is just so much slower. There are sea cucumbers and other organisms that live on the bottom of the deep sea floor where it's very cold. And they have such low metabolic rate and they live a life at such a slow pace that they live for hundreds of years. Right? Where if you have like a little tiny mouse, it's it's like this pace of life is really, really fast, right? Really high metabolic rate. Lives really fast. It doesn't have a long lifespan, right? So so it's not a direct correlation metabolic rate to life longevity, but you know, the lower your metabolic rate, lower your pace of life, usually the longer you live. So another physical factor that can be a limiting factor are nutrients, dissolved nutrients, right? A nutrient is a compound that's required uh, in the production of organic matter for, for primary productivity or just for biological processes for other organisms like ourselves. So the primary nutrients in the ocean for primary productivity are nitrates or nitrogen from nitrates and phosphorus from phosphates. Does anyone garden? No? So if, if, you, if you look at your fertilizer, it'll have three numbers. First number is the amount of nitrates, second number is the amount of phosphates, and third number is the amount of dissolvable potassium in what's called potash. Those are three essential nutrients for photosynthesis. Okay? And so that's why you fertilize your plants with fertilizer, nutrients. Whenever it rains and there's a bunch of runoff and it flushes human waste and fertilizer off of farm fields into the ocean, there's all these nutrients that flow into the ocean. And so L, L, there you get these algae blooms, right? Algae just explode because there's so much nutrients in the water, right? So you get these algal blooms cause these influx of nutrients during uh, precipitation events. Calcium carbonate and silica are also nutrients. Organisms uh, like some phytoplankton, clams, oysters, they need dissolved calcium carbonate in the water to make their shells and hard structures out of them. Talk about that calcareous ooze, right? Those little tiny phytoplankton make their structures out of calcium carbonate and the silicious ooze. So that stuff is also considered to be a nutrient. So those are some examples of physical factors in the ocean that can act as limiting factors. Next we have biological factors. So these factors are factors that influence life as well. And so these biological factors in some include diffusion, osmosis, active transport, and surface to volume ratio. Okay, well, we'll start with diffusion. Diffusion is the mixing of a material due to random molecular movements. So, in every something you hear, something diffuses, or like say a situation diffused, it kind of de escalated, right? It was really intense, and it kind of diffused. So, uh, you spray, you spray some cologne or perfume. It's very, very strong, right? Because when, as soon as you spray it, those molecules, that the, the perfume or cologne in the air is very concentrated. Over time, due to random molecular movements, the, mole, the molecules of the cologne or perfume, they become more and more spread out. And eventually, they'll become evenly distributed in the room. And that process of them going from a concentrated state to a dilute state through the random molecular motion is called diff diffusion, right? 
So if you, if you pass gas in a room, you hope it diffuses. It's not concentrated before someone walks in, right? <laughs> Depends on the crowd. Depends <laughs> on the crowd, right? <laughs> yeah. No, if it's completely diffuse, right? Uh, it's equally spread out in the room, right? No. So osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a membrane, like a cellular membrane. Uh, and, and this is important uh, when you look at cells and how water moves into or out of a cell through the cell membrane when that cell is in water of different salinities. So a solution where the salinity is the same as the salinity inside the cell, that's known as isotonic. So the same concentration of dissolved substances inside the cell as outside the cell. But a cell, I would say of an organism, if it's not in an isotonic solution, it's either in a hypertonic solution or a hypotonic solution. Hyper, if someone's hyperactive, right? Their, their activity is above the normal, right? And so hypertonic means that the salinity of the solution outside the cell is higher than the salinity inside the cell. A hypotonic solution, hypo, like hypothermic, is below. Hypotonic solution is never the salinity outside the cell is lower than the salinity inside the cell. And if an organism finds itself in a hyper hypotonic solution, it has to be able to provide uh, uh, perform what's known as active transport. That's moving a substance like water across against the concentration gradient. Um, and active transport requires energy. What basically that means, if you have two different fluids that have different salinities, they're going to mix and have a uniform salinity because those dissolved salts are going to diffuse. But say if you go in salt water, the salinity inside your body is lower than salinity in that water. And so like a fish that lives in salt water, constantly it's going to be absorbing salts and it has to excrete that salt from inside its cells because it has a lower salinity inside of its cells than outside the salt water. Where a fish living in fresh water, it has a higher salinity inside its cells than the water outside. So it lives in a hypotonic solution. So it has to constantly try to retain its salts. So we'll get there. First, this is an illustration of diffusion. Uh, you can see this dye, this cube of dye is placed in the water. And over time, the dye diffuses throughout the water so that it's equally distributed. Here you can see the demonstration of that uh, concept of entropy we talked about, right? This is a state of, of high, sorry, low entropy. It's very organized, right? All the dye is in this nice, neat cube, very organized. What happens? Nature tends to a state of high entropy, where this is as disorganized as it can be. The dye is equally distributed throughout the water. Okay, so in order to fight off diffusion, you need energy you need to to fight off the increase in entropy. And so here is a cell. So the the uh, the blue spheres represent water molecules and the green represent dissolved salts. So here's a cell membrane. This is inside the cell. This is outside the cell. The ratio of water to salts is the same. So the ratio of blue spheres, the green spheres is the same inside as it is outside. So this cell is in an isotonic solution. So water does not want to move across this membrane because the concentration or the salinity is equal on both sides of the cell. But here, this cell, you can see that the ratio of salt to water is much lower, right? There's more water than salt inside the cell than outside the cell. Outside the cell, there's more salts to water. So that means the outside the cell has a higher salinity. And so what happens is water will want to leave inside the cell and go outside the cell to try to de try to water wants to leave here to try to make this 
higher constant, more concentrated, increase the salinity here, and flow over here to dilute this and decrease the salinity over there. So water flows out of the cell because it's trying to e e e equate the salinity. If water leaves the cell, and the, then the, the cell, the interior of the cell will become more saline. And if the water goes to outside the cell, the, the, out, the solution outside the cell will become less saline. Does that make any sense? It does. It's so uh, has anyone ever made eggplant parm or make eggplant? So a good rule of thumb is you soak eggplant in salt water. Why? Because it takes like some of the bitterness out of it. Soak in salt water because the solution of the water is more, it's, it's more saline than the water inside the eggplant. The water inside the eggplant is drawn out because it's trying to concentrate. So if, you, if the water leaves the eggplant, the salinity is going to increase inside eggplant, and that water is going to try to decrease the salinity of the water outside. That's why if you, if, you, if you have an infection and you put your, if you have an infection, you put it in salt water, it draws the infection out, right? Because water's pulled out of your wound, bringing some of the infection with it, trying to increase the salinity inside your, your, inside your wound and decrease the salinity of the water outside. So water flows from, water flows from low to high salinity, okay? And so if you put a cell in a, a hypertonic solution, that cell is going to shrivel up. The water is going to be sucked out of it unless you can perform active transport and hold that water in there. If you put a cell in a hypotonic solution where the salinity inside the cell is higher than salinity outside the cell, water is going to, flo is going to flood into that cell, causing it to expand and potentially rupture. Okay, and so organisms have to manage this if they live in water in the ocean that has a different salinity than the interiors of the body. And so the managing of the salinity inside the organism's body, if there's a different salinity outside, it's called osmoregulation, and that requires active transport. And so fish have to osmo, most fish have to osmoregulate. And so a saltwater fish, it absorbs excess salts, right? Because the solution, the, the water outside of it is saltier than water inside of it. So it has to dispel excess salts. And so um, saltwater fish, they have very, very salty urine because in performing an act of transport, that's how they dispel the salts, okay? And they're in their urine. Uh, where freshwater fish, they have to retain their salts. Their salts are going to leave them and go into the less salty water around them. And so they have very dilute urine. Very, very, their, their, their urine is less salty than the water around them, okay, because they're trying to retain their salts. Okay, and so at a cellular level, they have to perform active transport, or else that saltwater fish it would shrivel up. Now, freshwater fish would, yeah, it would swell up. Okay. So these are these are stenohaline fish. Okay. Uh, fish organisms that are stenohaline. That means that they can only tolerate a. Well, I shouldn't say those are stenohaline. Uh, well, first we'll talk about urihaline. So urihaline organisms are organisms that are able to adapt to large ranges of salinity. So they can live in water that has a high or low salinity. And so organisms that are urihaline, urihaline usually live in estuaries where there's large fluctuations in salinity. So at high tide, in the estuary is going to be a, have a high salinity. At low tide, estuaries where fresh and, and salt water are mixing, say in a bay or a lagoon or something, uh, at low tide, you have more fresh water coming in, seawater is moving out, so you have a lower salinity. So, for example, a green crab, it's a urihaline organism where its body can just tolerate these large fluctuations in salinity. 
where other organisms are yuri haline because they're very good osmoregulators. They maintain the same salinity inside their body. They're just able to do that within a wide range of salinity. So, for example, salmon and eels. Salmon spawn in freshwater streams. Okay? So salmon can live in fresh water. They swim out to the sea. They live their lives eating krill and other stuff. That's how they get the that's how they get the beta carotene from the krill. Like the you know how crustaceans are look orange, right? That's the beta carotene. 